Giving He loved me Dying He saved me Buried He carried My sins far away Rising He just Freely forever One day He's come Love technology, but when you forget to push buttons Put batteries in your microphone All kind of things can happen <laughs> Uh, yeah, I know it's got a red light. I can tell. I can tell it wasn't on there, but it's. Uh, oh well, we 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 get through things, and uh, I need one of those solar clips or something on this thing here. Uh, if you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 17, beginning with verse 20, John chapter 17, beginning with verse 20, the whole chapter of John 17 is Jesus praying, not only for us, for others. And so I really love the whole chapter of 17 because that's the longest chapter that Jesus' longest prayer. And it, it just, it's just a wonderful chapter. So let's hear what the Word of God has to say to us in John chapter 17, beginning with verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, and that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, and that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that they have sent me, and has loved them, as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world have not known me, but I have known thee, and these have known that I has sent me, that y'all has, thou has sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Thanks be reading to God's word in the New Testament. Now, you've heard all these slogans, and it comes up once in a while, and this one slogan, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And remember those letters were everywhere inside the church, outside the church. And also they made these bracelets that it had on there and rings that had WWJD on there. What would Jesus do? And, uh, and, and you know, the Christians put this on to, to, to have this part of saying, oh, before I do this, what would Jesus do? Now, it, it's a very good thing to really do because a lot of things we do if we put that in our mindset first we would not do the things we do uh, for instance if someone pulls out in front of us and we all have that to happen and we are so graciously say thank you as they go around us <laughs> and we think what would Jesus do and we're thinking well Jesus would zap them <laughs> he would just take them off the road completely and put them somewhere out in the desert no Jesus wouldn't do that but that's things that we have to look at. What would Jesus do? And I think it's a good concept, trying to creatively image what Jesus would do in our lives in each situation that we had planned. Uh, so these four-letter words were, were really clarify our ethical thinking big time if we would use that a lot. And you notice it kind of went away, didn't it? You don't see it no more. And it's, it's like a fad. Why, why, why is that? Well, I want to ask a different question today. What would Jesus do, but what would Jesus pray for? If Jesus was here among us today, walking the earth, Jesus is with us, but if he was walking the earth like he was then, what would Jesus pray for? And you have all kind of things would come up, I know. Uh, world peace and, and, and things like that. Everybody will be uh, a Christian and, and all kind of things. And I'm sure that we would tell Jesus what he needs to pray for. We'd be some of them saying, Jesus, you need to pray for this right here. We would do it or bust. So 
Well, it may seem a little strange to think about Jesus praying. After all, he's the second person of the Trinity, of course, the Son, the Father, the the Holy Spirit. And we think, well, why would Jesus need to pray? He's God. He's praying to himself. He's praying to God. And what, what, why would Jesus need to pray to God? Well, he would hear him. And he would know what he's doing because he is God. And that kind of boggles our mind a little bit. And uh, so we think, what is the sense for Jesus praying then? And I think he did a lot just for our examples. Jesus prayed a lot. And he did it for our examples on how we should pray. Now, an ancient description of the Trinity is what they call the circle dance. You can look it up on YouTube and see people still doing it today. People of Greece, Israel, and some Mediterranean countries still practice this ancient dance uh, even today. And what this dance is, they go around and around in circle. Uh, they spin. As they draw a big. They have a big circle, and they get in the circle, and they just start spinning around and the circle moves and they try to do it faster and faster and to waves of music of course and it almost looks like the individuals are blurred if you look at it a certain way you know they're going real fast and look like how blurry but also you can pick out the individual and looking at the individual and all of them united together and spinning around you think yourself you know wow i can see jerry in that circle right there even though it's kind of blurry there he goes and it's the same thing with the holy spirit and the, the God, the Father, the Trinity, because they're all mixed into one, and sometimes it, uh, it's together, and all of a sudden you pick out, there's Jesus, there's the Holy Spirit, there's God. They're all one, but they all merged, but you can pick out each one. There was a time when Jesus, uh, God's Son, walked this earth. And we, every Christmas, we were, you know, where God sent His Son into the world, and we celebrate Christmas that way. Uh, we, we, we know when Jesus has walked his teachings, what we lear- learned about in the Gospels and Acts and all the Bible, we learn about how Jesus walked this earth and what he did. And there was a time when he inhabited a human body. God inhabited a human body to walk upon this earth to give us an example that he is God. And he wanted to be here to express the same anxieties that we have, doubts, bafflement, like the rest of us. He had no sin. And he wasn't going to create sin inside him because God does not do that. But God wanted to experience the pain that we go through, some anxiety that we go through. He cried when uh, Lazarus was dying. He cried upon many others, and he healed others. One thing he did during that time uh, on earth is that he prayed. He prayed a lot. And... We know this because the scripture tells us, and we just read part of his prayer in John chapter 17. He prayed a lot. And that's a good example that that he gives us, is that he does pray. And he expects us to pray. He prayed uh, when he went off to a lonely place to pray. And he tells us that, and sometimes we need to get out into a lonely place and pray. And pray that God will relieve us of our sin that we either done or something that's bothering us real heavenly uh you know sometimes uh jesus prayed when he was healing someone and he lift up his eyes to heaven and pray and offer up a prayer we bow our heads of respect to god we bow our heads because we will be lower than god but it's okay also if you pray and you're looking up to the heavenly father forgive me i have sinned forgive me i've done this or god i want to talk to you it's okay to have your eyes open. It's okay to have your eyes open when you're driving and praying. Hopefully that you will be having your eyes open. And Jesus gives us these things uh, for an example. And he was called the highly priest. And in the scripture, John 17, literally means, uh, uh, it comes from this, this chapter of the Gospel of John as the high priestly prayer is what it's called in our sector. Chapter 17, the high priestly prayer. Because Jesus was a high priestly, wasn't he? He was a priest, someone to intercede for one another. Now, we have Jesus to intercede for us when we pray. But do we have someone to intercede for us, or I say accountability partner, to be with you when you mess up or when you do things? Well, if we're married, I have Edna. Edna's my wonderful uh, partner there that... uh, keeps me straight. It's a full-time job. She works 27 hours a day to keep me straight. 
and but she's my accountability partner and she will let me know and sometimes we have us men and, and, and wives with our partners we sometimes think well they're snooping well if you ain't doing it wrong and ain't snooping because it's just it's open but sometimes you have to be set straight and sometimes your partner has to do that which brings you back to God and it brings you back to the prayers here that Jesus taught us to do is come to here in prayer of forgiveness when you brought before the carpet to doing something wrong or right or, or any other thing you've done or you're thinking that you, you need help or need prayer for a certain healing well you have God there and being the high priest as he was he sits on the side, right hand side of the father intercedes for us and hears our prayers and we come to him just like Jesus did as an example and what is he praying for on our behalf in chapter 17, what is he praying for? Well, a number of things, actually, but the most famous part of this prayer is what we read starting in verse 21. The Lord goes on a little later to say a little bit more what he means by these requests. But in those couple of verses, 23 and 23, uh, 22 and 23, says, The glory that you have given me, I have given them. He's given us that same glory, so that they may be one as we are one. Unity unity when we're married we are one that's what God says isn't it and that's what I say when I am married a couple I'm married a couple in a couple of weeks and that's one of the things you're united you're no longer individuals you're one I in them and you in me is what Jesus is saying you're in me I'm in you as the Holy Spirit and you're in me and that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me. See, the way we act and the way we do in, in this world is showing other people that God has sent us on this earth to proclaim his name. The devil does not want that. The devil will do anything in his power to destroy that. Destroy families, destroy churches. And one little thing, he can drop a bomb and it like explodes. He can tear up the church, tear up families, families from friends, and it just mushrooms on out. And next thing you know, it's almost like a, a big bomb went off and destroyed a lot of faith, a lot of uh, things that God has put entrusted, that you entrusted into the church or into the people. So... What God is here telling us here is that we got to unite as one. And as Tinja says, and love them even as you have loved me. He says, God loved them like you love me. And you think God hated Jesus? Yes, you said, because maybe he put him on the cross. No, that was his design purpose. That was his only begotten son. That he loved Jesus and Jesus is praying for us. God loved them. Now, in the Old Testament, we see a lot of things in here where God, what, to strike people and dead. Uh, he takes them away from villages and destroyed all this right here. And he had a purpose and design, uh, design for that. We don't know what it is, and we just leave it. It's God's glory. But, you know, Jesus is telling him, God, forgive them because you love me. Love them like you love me. And that's a wonderful, wonderful prayer that Jesus is saying to God, love them like you love me. That's a powerful love. Because he loved Jesus. Jesus without sin. We're full of sin. We're full of it. But Jesus wasn't. So what would Jesus pray for? I say he'd pray for unity. Unity. What a great many of fathers and mothers pray as for well. A father and mother pray for the unity of their family. That their family will be together. That they won't have this animosity between each other. You know siblings, I was five in my family. Lord, I didn't know what my mom and dad went through, but they went through a lot. We fought all the time. We thought that was just natural to do. I mean, we played tricks, fought, and everything else. We thought, well, that's, that's what you do. But as you grow up, you think that maybe that was left behind, but let's see it in a lot of families, don't we? We see it in a lot of families, especially when loved ones go, uh, their families uh, leave them uh, an inheritance. Oh, man, it is awful. So sometimes it happens that brothers and sisters fall out with one another later down in years. 
a family feud arises. Some of these rifts in the family, they can go on for a very long, long time. But through it all, the one who's most likely to be asking, can't we all get along? I would say the mom would be the most likely to say that. We need to get along. We need to come together. We need to unify one another. And we need to come and stop this right here. A mom would say that more than the dad would. And I'll put dads down because Father's Day is coming up. And I've got a question to ask a couple of you fathers here uh, when we we'll leave service. But the mother, the mother will say that. Unity comes naturally for a woman or a mother. That's what bio, uh, the biological of motherhood is all about. You know, we all began our lives in oneness. We are one with our mothers in the womb. She's carrying us. You're one. You actually are one. Fathers, you not actually are one, but, you know, fathers love their children too. But there's something to bond there and unity with a mother because she carried you. She is with you. You bonded as one in the womb as they grow to nine months to the baby's born. That bondage is there. And that's the point Jesus here is getting at in this great prayer for the church. Is there's a power that's active in our lives, which is Jesus Christ that brings us together. Just like a mother brings families together. It's a bond that Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit upon each one of us to bring us together instead of animosity between this person and that person. Our church has been very blessed in its unity, and we pray that it continue this unity. That power that Jesus himself comes in is often the way we discover unity with another person is not by seeking it directly. We discover it by turning to Jesus in our faith, accepting his offer of unity with us, and when we offer that unity, we can see more clearly. Sometimes we get fogged up in life. We get fogged up a lot. There's so much going on in our world. We're just, it's amazing that we can keep up. You know what? Even in my job and uh, with my company that I work for, that changes are happening so rapidly. And as a mass, mass corporation worldwide, it is so much going on, it's impossible to look at every little detail. So instead of looking at every detail of the worldwide mass there, I go to God to, for direction to guide me in what I am supposed to do for this corporation, this small part. But it's got to be unified. And only God can do that. If two individuals share the unit, this unity in Christ, they can overcome all manner of differences. When you share this unity with Christ, you can overcome it, no matter what it is. Is it going to be easy? No. It's plain and simple. We've got so many different the versions when we try to do this. The devil will pounce upon you in a skinny minute when you start getting closer to God or closer to unity. He does not want unity because he knows if we are unified together, even in families and church, that he does not have a chance. But when he picks us individually and start using us and start breaking us down, that's when trouble comes in. So being unified together through Jesus Christ, unity would be there. But unity isn't something we achieve on our own. We can't achieve it on our own. We can't hardly get out of the parking lot and drive home without sinning, right? How many, I'm going to raise my hand first, has left this building, got on Interstate 85, going towards Spartanburg, that you didn't get mad at somebody pulling out in front of you, going around you this way right here, and somebody come flying around you and you say, oh, look at that idiot. And guess what? <laughs> Last week I was on 85 and I was going uh, 
85. And uh, he's doing the same thing I was doing, but yet because he did it to me. So you see how easy, how easy uh, that unity can be broken apart when we walk out these doors. It's easy while we're in here, real easy. So if we cultivate a personal relationship with him, we open our hearts and truly let him in, then our hearts are open to good people. The world over will be no longer strangers, but brothers and sisters in Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ. That's something we have to watch for, isn't it? When we talk about other churches, are they worshiping as Jesus Christ? They might not believe the same way we believe in our doctrine. But do they believe in Jesus Christ? Do they believe that He is the Son of God? No matter what, if they're they handling snakes or whether they sit in solemnly like we are. But if they're praising God, can we say or condemn? Jesus said there will be others in doing other things and, and worshiping me in other ways. But we got to unify this right here. Look at the things that we can stamp out if all the churches and all the Christians unify and take Jesus' prayer in John 17 and we all utilize it as unity coming to one as Christ around this world, we will be able to travel any place in this world and feel safe. We don't even feel safe going to our own airport and flying. We can stop out a lot of stuff by unifying only if we do through Jesus and it's unity think of the implications for our lives think about it if this happens think how different our lives would be if we could meditate on Jesus prayer more often our lives would be changed you'd be surprised how many people didn't even know that chapter 17 was totally Jesus' prayer if you really want to know what Jesus was praying about, go to 17, and that right there is the whole lump sum. Unity. Love. As His Father loved Him. Now, sometimes, you and I are in tune with this powerful truth. And other times, less so. The place we're in tune with most often is in church. When we're in church, we are really in tune with God, aren't we? We'll say amen, hallelujah, praise God, sing glorious songs, glorious songs to God. We read His Word. We feel good. And then when we leave this sanctuary, that's where the test really begins. After we leave here, we tell our children, don't run in church. Don't do this in church because... It's our church. Don't say words like that because you're in church. <laughs> Guess what? Your body is a temple of God and that is church. Wherever you go is church. We forget that so much. And a lot of times we want to push it back to where we can sin. We want to push God back and say, okay God, I want you to hear my prayerful vision close by in case I fall. I'm going to handle this right here. And you get deeper and deeper and deeper. The first time and distance uh, cities that God went to, walking into uh, in these different cities and telling these church leaders, this is what you got to do. And this is the same thing he's telling our church leaders. This is what we got to do. We got to come together in unity. And you got to become unity in God. Or you can do it. If you don't have that relationship with Jesus, if you don't have that love and that unity, then you don't have it. The reason we enjoy unity with our mothers in this life and by God's grace 
also in the uh, in this next thing is because certain experiences we hold. We bond with our mothers because a lot, and fathers, teaching a child to talk, walk, hold a spoon is a powerful, powerful bondage. I watch Edna with our granddaughter, and she teaches you got to hold this your, over your plate. You got to hold your spoon over this. You got to do this a certain way. Teaching her, and she loves that, and she'll go to Edna for. If she falls down, hurts herself, or, or something like that, she runs to Edna. Say, I'm a play toy. Edna and her bonds. I'm just a toy. If she wants to come up and run and hit and play and do all this right here, she comes to me. But for teaching and that bondage, Edna has that over me. But it's more than just those common experiences. It's, it's more than genetic heritage. It's the bonds that truly unites a family is the bond of love. And that's what Jesus is telling us here, is that bondage of love. He talks about love in his highly priestly prayer. He talks about, I made your name known to them, and I will make it known so that the love which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. That is powerful. In the end, it's all about love. Sounds like a Beatles song, doesn't it? But it is all about love. Even with parents and children reconciled a long years of estrangement, the love is still there. I have seen families spread apart for many, many, many years. Our family is. I have a brother that doesn't recognize. Of course, he doesn't believe in God either, so it's a difficult situation there. But when my sister her child and grandchild died unexpectedly. Even though he hadn't talked in years and years, he called. So you see, that love is still there, isn't it? It's still there. God put it there as a gift for all of us. It's a tie that binds us together as Christians, and it's a gift, and it's nothing but a gift from God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your blessings that you've given us. Thank you for your words, your prayer that you showed us in John 17. Father, is so powerful. We ask that your Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of us here that will unify us together. We pray for our families that you bring them together according to your will, Father, and your gifts that you give us. That's that love. We pray for our church family here that we are come together even stronger in unity and love. May you bless the congregation here. May you bless this church. May you bless our families. Forgive us of our sinful ways. And give us grace, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.